Start. Good morning, everyone. I'm Paul Levy, the Research Events Coordinator at uh, Swinburne. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar, which is titled What's the Value of Voice, uh, which is being presented by the Social Innovation Research Institute at Swinburne. I'll hand over shortly to uh, Professor Jane Farmer, who is the Director of the Institute, and uh, Professor Valerie Jones, who will be uh, our guest speaker for the session. Uh, but before I hand over, I'd just like to acknowledge our traditional owners. I acknowledge that I'm hosting this webinar from the lands of the Wurundjeri people in the Kulin Nation. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all work today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this webinar. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and I celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters just some very brief uh, housekeeping. Um, we will have Q&A at the end of the presentation. Uh, feel free to pop comments in the chat or Q&A uh, and we'll go through those uh, at the end. If you'd like to uh, verbally ask a question, just raise your hand and I can enable your microphone. And just to let you know that we will be recording the session. Uh, so if you're not, do, don't feel comfortable ha having your voice included in the recording when we share afterwards, just email me uh, at the email address below. Uh, so I will now hand over to Jane with today's session. Jane, over to you. Thanks, Paul. And um, thanks everyone for being here. Um, especially thanks to Valerie. I'll just do a little bit of a slight introduction to Valerie and then I'll hand over to Valerie to give her talk. So um, it's, it's great pleasure to have Valerie here at Swinburne as our visiting Fulbright scholar, or as it says on Valerie's LinkedIn page, Fulbrighter. I love that idea of being a Fulbrighter, but anyway, um, I look back at my emails and I realized that you first contacted us on the 9th of September, 2021, Valerie, with the idea of um, us partnering on a Fulbright. And uh, I, Valerie was awarded this on uh, April the 1st. I think um, it's great for Swinburne to have a Valerie and these kinds of opportunities because um, in Australia, there aren't that many kinds of grant opportunities uh, for us to meet international colleagues. And so anything like that should be jumped upon um, because it's great to just get exposure to the wider world, I guess. Um, Valerie works at the University of Nebraska and um, you know, in best traditions, I Googled that this morning, and found out it was a Public Land Grant Research University, which is the awesomest, best kind, in my opinion, although I haven't got a great uh, deal of expertise. Um, notable alumni from the University of Nebraska are Warren Buffett. So I assume that uh, it's a very rich university because I'm sure he gives you lots of cash. Johnny Carson and John Pershing, who I believe lots of missiles are named after. Um, so Valerie is the Associate Professor and Director of the Public Insight Lab. Um, she's bravely come to Melbourne immediately post pandemic, which uh, means that she's come to a highly disconnected environment where perhaps people are largely speaking to their home voice assistants. So maybe it is a great environment to be doing your research. Um, and yeah, without further ado, I want to hand over to Valerie, who'll maybe tell you a little bit more about herself and uh, her amazing research. Thank you so much, Jane and Paul. I'm going to attempt to share slides first here. Let's see. Yeah, does that look good? You can see that? Okay. Yep, that's coming through. Perfect. Um, well, Jane and I had the pleasure of uh, chatting over Zoom a few times while I was working on the Fulbright application since you know September of 21, and I knew that I would be in for for learning a lot um, and a, a pretty fantastic personality and a group of people to work with. Um, it's been so much fun talking with Jane. She helped me kind of shape the research that I'll be doing here. Um, so you know, Australia can have me back anytime. By the way, I I will. I will schlep over here uh, anytime. Um, but yeah, my presentation here today is uh, about the value of voice. 
So I'm going to start with uh, a story. I'm going to tell a lot of stories. I actually belong to the College of Journalism and Mass Communications, and so we we tell stories. So I'm going to start with a story. I'll tell you a little bit about kind of where I'm coming from in terms of the, the research that I do. Um, uh, Nebraska is the best, by the way. The public land grant university system is fantastic. So I'll just I'll just verify that Jane was right in that um, in that statement. So I'll tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from and kind of my background. Um, I'll tell you a lot of stories about the research I've done and, and why I think it matters. We'll talk some about the limitations and then where I think it's going in the future. And then we'll have time at the end for uh, for questions and discussion. And as Jane pointed out, you know, we don't have a lot of opportunities for this kind of thing. And so please, please ask questions, make comments. I'm here. One of the, the most beautiful things about being here isn't just my phenomenal project, clearly, that I'll tell you about, um, but it's getting to have these sorts of opportunities and these sorts of conversations with people that I otherwise um, wouldn't have met. So don't hold back. All right, so this first story um, uh, I got a call in my office. This was uh, fall of 2020 um, from a woman who was the daughter of one of the participants in, in one of my studies, which I'll tell you about later. But she called to tell me that her mother had just passed away and she wanted to know if we needed this little device back. This is an Amazon Echo Dot, the generation that was around in 2020. And I told her, no, we didn't need it back. And her mother uh, was one of my favorite people. She was uh, 92 and had an incredible life and amazing stories. I told her we didn't need it back. She could keep it or regift it or bury it in the garden, whatever she wanted to do. And she said, well, I wanted to tell you that my mother said good morning and good night to it every day. And uh, she would call me and tell me about the you know ridiculous jokes that uh, Alexa told her, she said, uh, Alexa really was a good companion for her. And her daughter had actually talked to people at this um, residential aged care facility where she lived to see if everyone could have one in their rooms because her mom had just found so much value in voice, just having something to talk to. Now, this was a, a woman who she had family, you know, she was close with her daughter. She had other people to talk to in this residential aged care facility. People were generally pretty well off and there were a lot of activities, um, but still she found value in having something in her own home <clears throat> that made it feel less alone. Um, and so, so that started telling me that there, there was something about interacting with voice, even if it wasn't with a person. I mean, in a perfect world, we would be interacting with people. We'd have uh, our relatives visiting us all the time. We would have friends visiting all the time, but but we don't live in a perfect world. So in the interim, in the meantime, can interacting with AI uh, make a difference? We've been finding value in voice for a long time, right? So this is a picture here of a family gathered around a radio, and it's in front of the radio station that my grandfather helped start in the middle of Nebraska. Nebraska is in the middle of the country. It is an eight hour drive from Chicago. As I try to give you some reference that you might have, it is in flyover country and it is largely agricultural. Um, and so my grandfather started a radio station that was farmer and rancher owned and it was meant to provide the news and weather in particular and information and connections for a rural agricultural community that otherwise had news and weather and all that coming from places um, far away that, that didn't understand their needs, that didn't give them the weather that they needed, the community connections that they needed. So we've been finding value in voice for a long time. And I see this, um, uh, things like smart speakers, like these voice assistants, as kind of the latest iteration of that, right? We're, but now obviously it's highly personalized, highly tailored, unresponsive. It starts to get to know us and we can ask it anything we want and it can connect us with others, with the world and with it itself. If I start to talk too fast, by the way, throw it into the chat or something like that because I get really excited and I do have this, whatever the American accent is, I have that 
and then some. So let me know if I need to slow down. So uh, before academia, I did have a life before academia. I had a life before academia, and then it stopped. No, I did do things professionally before before academia. I worked in media strategy, so in advertising. Um, and I wasn't making cool ads. I was thinking about uh, the media and the technology and how we could reach different types of people with different types of messages through different types of media. So I worked with a bunch of these brands, um, created advert games for Kellogg when that was new many moons ago. I think Kraft's first online advertising plan when they were trying to get people to use Kraft salad dressings through recipes. So this is what I did for a living. Um, but then I started teaching as an adjunct at the University of Nebraska, and I kind of fell in love with it um, and wanted to have the space to focus on teaching, to focus on students, and to focus on, on research on these bigger questions about how, what are, how can we use media to help move the needle in more important ways. Um, so not just maybe to get people to buy Apple Jacks, although they are a delight. So the first study that I that I did was focused on kind of you can see my professional background coming through in this right, but it was about these voice assistants again the Amazon um, Echoes of the world the Google Nests of the world these kind of smart speakers, and what it meant for marketing and advertising. The participants in one of these studies, in this study in particular, just had a great quote that I'll, that I always keep in mind and that has kind of fueled the rest of my research actually and I think uh, it resonates with a lot of folks at Swinburne as well with this idea of people and technology together for a better world right so he said that he remembered you know he remembered people talking about this intelligent homes for a long time you know we've been talking about it since the Jetsons and there's something really intriguing about intelligent homes that they can do all these things for you and make your life easier. He said it remains to be seen, right? Isn't making people happier, smarter, safer, richer, more informed, better citizens, better humans? But I don't know. What I feel like often doesn't happen is that we don't stop to think. <clears throat> so I started really focusing on, on, on this media, on kind of voice activated AI and how it can be helpful. How can it help make our lives richer? How can it help make our lives happier? And I found a, a particular um, opportunity, I thought, with older people who didn't then have to learn a particular interface um, or a new program, but could access all these things um, with their voice. So at the same time, you know, there's been a lot of press lately, certainly post COVID and during COVID, but even beforehand, you know, Vivek Murthy, our, our uh, twice Surgeon General wrote this book called Together about the healing power of human connection in a sometimes lonely world. And we all started to realize that, uh, that sorry, I'm getting these notifications. Oops, dismiss all reminders. Okay. Oops. Hold on. Here we are. Ah. It, it, uh, Valerie, I was just going to say, look, we can't see anything other than the, the power of your presentation. So all Fantastic. good. I will keep up the sound effects, though, just to keep you all guessing about what is happening on her screen. All right. Well, that's good. So there started to be more attention paid to this idea of these feelings of loneliness and how it can be bad for our health and how we all need um, social connection. So I saw an opportunity with these voice assistants, since they're interactive, they're personalized, they're responsive, they're easy to use, you know, they're wildly affordable. Could just talking to something like this um, help, help influence these feelings of loneliness? So uh, I created this first study. This is the one where the um, participant's daughter called me. And it was really kind of focused on feasibility. I made this giant list. I don't expect you to be able to read all of these things, but of things you could do with this voice assistant. Um, and the idea was for people to choose five things off of this list, at least five things a day to do that they enjoyed. And I encourage people to you know, mark on this, highlight it, whatever things they like to do, it was up to them. 
um, and and I just ask that they that they interact regularly. This was people living alone who are 78 and older in residential aged care. So not surprisingly, you know, it was used a lot for music. It was used a lot for weather because that is very important in the Midwest. Um, it was used a lot for just timers and reminders um, to help people fall asleep um, with some kind of relaxing sounds um, and some for games and conversation, things like that. And we found that first of all, like this was feasible, you know, people could, could learn this fairly easily. It's imperfect, right? But for an out of the box thing that you mostly just plug in and connect to Wi-Fi, um, it was pretty easy to use. Um, and it did significantly influence these, these feelings of loneliness. So we gave them you know, surveys before and after and interviewed them as well. Um, and after, at the end of the study, it did, did, they did have fewer feelings of, of loneliness. I do want to say, right, this does not assume that all older people are lonely, that this is an, an issue that only affects older people, an issue that affects only people living alone. That's not the case. We all deal with these feelings. Um, but when, you know, like so many of these people had been, you know, married for decades, <laughs> and then you find yourself in a, in a living alone without another voice in the house, um, this kind of thing can matter, just having a response. And then we found that um, people who treated it more like a person, that that kind of predicted these loneliness reductions. So we coded all of their interactions and we found that those who use these relational greetings, um, that that predicted these reductions in these feelings of loneliness. So when people said things like, good morning, and hello, Alexa, and Alexa, I'm going down for supper. One was, Alexa, um, I'm leaving, you're in charge of the cats, um, or good night. Um, that, that this was a factor. Right? So since then, whoop, nope. We also found that uh, interaction time correlates with larger reductions in feelings of loneliness. So I was curious, she saw some research um, from here in Australia with uh, RMIT and Bolton Clark about this brooch that counted the number of words spoken. So an older adult would wear this brooch. <clears throat> if they dipped below a certain number of words per day spoken, a caregiver would be notified. So we just did this analysis. I was curious about if just number of words spoken to the device um, would relate to these, these feelings of loneliness. It wasn't quite that linear. But interaction time was. So the more time you spent interacting with Alexa, um, that related to this larger reduction of feelings of loneliness. Because we have all of the data from these interactions. So we, we, we know everything that people said to Alexa. We know everything that was said back. Um, and that's really helped us understand um, the role that this can play. So since then, um, we built out kind of an interdisciplinary team. So I'm working with a gerontologist um, at the University of Nebraska Omaha, a, a nurse at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and there are two of us in the College of Journalism and Mass Communications. We all have slightly different questions, which has helped inform the research. So I actually worked with a journalism colleague to interview people about their use over the pandemic. So we followed up with folks, right? Adoption is one thing. We like, a lot of us like new toys, right? It's new technology. This is so fun. Let me tinker with it, blah, blah, blah. Many older people are no different. So we were wondering if people would continue using it over the course of the pandemic, even if they didn't have to anymore, right? So even if we weren't asking them to, would they keep doing it? Um, and we found that that most did. Um, they found it to be reliable. A number of people talked about just how they knew that if they said its name, if they said Alexa, then it would respond. And that was always the case. Um, they talked about it facilitating independence. So just setting timers and reminders um, can help them feel like they can, can better manage their lives and help them help them keep track of what was going on. Um, 
connected them with feelings of nostalgia through music. Music was the top use as it is for all of us. Um, but many people would play, you know, we saw many people connecting with music that they hadn't heard for a long time. We all have, you know, they didn't have the CDs or the records or uh, the tapes accessible that had their music on it. And they could just call out the name of the artist they wanted to listen to. And folks connected with, uh, with things they hadn't heard since, since they were younger. Um, and that was really beautiful for them to be able to be reminded of, of times with their families um, or times with a spouse that had passed. You know, we had one who uh, she, she'd go dancing with her husband every Saturday night and listen to country music. So she listened to country music every Saturday night and it connected her with that time in her life. And they talked about it as companionship and security as well. They just it felt good having a presence in the home. It felt less empty. This isn't the case for everyone. This is the case for the people that, it, that, that we followed up with in our study, which was 16 to begin with. We had to stop recruiting because of the pandemic and we were able to get a hold of 10 of them. One had stopped using it um, and one used it less because she used other forms of media during the pandemic that were more immersive. Totally makes sense. She was using, um, she was joining, you know, uh, videos of like concerts from um, the Sydney uh, Opera House, right? So she was engaging in that way with more richer forms of media during the pandemic. But by and large, we found that people were continuing to, to use them in these in a, a pretty strange and weird time. Uh, we have a study where we're doing a second wave of recruitment right now. Um, the nurse on our team is particularly interested in non-pharmacological interventions for pain. She'd done some work with uh, Google Nests just to use them as reminders for medication with older adults. She knew that that worked and was feasible. But can uh, interacting with them in certain prescribed ways actually reduce these perceptions, self-reported perceptions of pain, as well as loneliness and depression? So we created routines for them, kind of loosely based on literature. We know that music can matter with these things. We know that meditation can matter with these things. Um, uh, we know that uh, even just things like uh, just interacting and using your voice, right? So we had them ask for the weather even and humor, a joke. The jokes are terrible, right? Y'all think about jokes you've heard from Alexa or Google Assistant. They're pretty bad. They're kind of like dad jokes. Like they can, they can make you roll your eyes at least, right? So we had them do these standardized um, routines and personalized routines where they got to choose the type of music or the types of jokes um, and uh, found that it did actually um, reduce these feelings of these perceptions of pain and loneliness and depression over the course of 16 weeks. Um, we also started looking at types of people. So we know that this isn't for everyone, right? A lot of people look at this and think it's dumb. It is dumb in many ways, um, but not think it's useful. And that's okay. This isn't the solution to loneliness. This isn't a solution to magically making us all more social, socially connected, to magically making us less isolated. But it can be part of an answer for certain types of people. I think. So we started having people um, complete a personality inventory too. So we can start to relate types of people to, to results. And then uh, we're finishing up a study right now that looks more at using these to facilitate social connection with other people. So we, uh, in this one, we required people to call someone through the devices. Um, some of them have um, video devices, so uh, with screens, and some of them just have audio. We're also interested in how people with maybe different levels of cognitive impairment, maybe dipping into mild cognitive impairment, um, how they might find um, kind of usefulness of those with a screen or those without a screen. Um, so we're trying to think of them more as a bridge to, you know, people that people love as a bridge to activities that people love uh, 
I, I got to see one guy in our study who was in the smallest apartment that I'd seen um, at a residential aged care. These have all been with residential aged care facilities. Um, and he had gotten an assistant with a screen. So he was kind of amazed, first of all, just when he plugged it in and it just shows different pictures, right? It shows different scenes from nature. And he thought that was pretty great in and of itself. Um, and then we you know, programmed in the person that he wanted to call. He uh, wasn't married, hadn't had kids, um, but had a niece that he talked to regularly. And so we called her and she answered through the uh, Alexa app she had on her phone. And we caught her um, in the middle of harvest. So uh, she was in this golden field and it was blue sky and she was there in her in her combine and she gave her uncle kind of a tour of the cab of her combine and just showed her where she kept different things and here's where she kept the snacks and and here's where she kept the the vodka that they'd all take a pull of when they do the last run on the fields and uh and it was pretty magical to get to see his face as he as he saw this environment that had been described to him but he hadn't seen himself in a long time The study that I'm here to do now um, has been influenced by my conversations with Jane and the, and the work of Siri. It's more focused on uh, social connection than necessarily these feelings of loneliness. So how do we, how can we use voice assistance to, to kind of proactively create these connections? And it's more focused on the voices of current users. So in the past, my work had been largely working with older adults, 75 and up, 78 and up, in uh, residential aged care facilities. Um, so it could be independent living or assisted living in the US, um, who hadn't used these at all before, but were interested, but were curious. Um, yeah, and then generally doing things that we asked them to do. This is about learning from those who have already said, yes, I want one of these and have already um, purchased and been using one of them on their own. So we're using learning from the current users to co-create this guide to using devices um, to help facilitate this, this social connection. Now, uh, whether that's helping them connect with other people, so maybe helping them learn to call people through it, um, helping them connect with even just locally relevant kind of news and activities. How do you feel more connected with, with your community? Um, or with your hobbies or interests, activities that you care about. Um, that's what we'll be working on developing uh, with the group here in Melbourne. Always be recruiting, right? Spruiking for the current study. Is that the right way to say that? Yes. I'm, I'm adapting. I'm learning. I'm growing. I hadn't heard spruiking before, and I just used it in a sentence. Gosh, this Fulbright is useful. Um, but spruiking for current studies. So if you know people who meet these criteria, you let me know or Jasmine Knox know. So we're just looking at younger folks, 55 and older. We're trying to keep the criteria very open um, who have already a Google Nest or an Amazon Echo in their home and live somewhere um, around here. And then we'll chat with them. Um, we'll give them questionnaires in the beginning and end. <clears throat> Um, but we want to understand how they're used, how they could be used, what social connection means to people, so that we can start to think, connect those things, start to think about how um, we might proactively use these devices to connect people with things and people in places and spaces that they care about. After this, um, I haven't done the study that I'm doing here in the US yet. So that's something that I hope to do. Um, but ultimately I, I'm interested in, in using these for proactive kind of personalized health for, for people who might be most likely to benefit. So we're using that personality inventory again, this will be the third time we've used it. So we'll have a good collection of data about Maybe the, the way that people see themselves and how that relates to um, the, the influence of these devices, of, the, of these interactions. What if, uh, what if we knew 
that Will, that's my husband in the other room, what if we knew that Will, when he felt the most slow or when he most wanted to connect with other people um, or the kinds of things that he cared about most. So what if, uh, in as in uh, one of the prior studies, a woman got particularly um, low on Saturday nights because she used to go out dancing with her husband on those nights. So what if we could proactively play happier music or music that she connected with on Saturday nights, if it could remind her, and this is all very possible right now, right? That if it could remind her to call her niece, daughter, nephew, neighbor, um, to go on a walk with uh, someone in the community, to do these things that were um, good for health and mental well-being and quality of life at a time when she knew that she might be needing a little nudge, right? That 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 can matter, I think. What about facilitating a social connection within and outside these living facilities and even tailored media for loneliness and social connection? And here's what I mean by that. So uh, over the summer, two of the participants in the studies um, had stories that really resonated with me that, that I think uh, we, can, we can work on. Um, one was a woman, she was 86, and she just moved to this, um, this residential aged care facility. It's quite nice. Um, but she had moved from Phoenix, Arizona, which is quite a ways from Nebraska. And uh, she lost her son and husband in the past six months. So she moved to Lincoln because she had one son left, and that's where he lived. But she said, I didn't want to leave Phoenix. I didn't want to leave my friends here. I don't know anyone else here besides my son. And we all thought that it made sense, <laughs> but she's moving to a place where she doesn't know anyone, you know, for the first time in a really long time. And she said, you know, she, she felt cognitively less together than she was um, six months prior. So how do we help use technology to help her connect with her neighbors? with the other people in the residential aged care community um, so that she had a place to start from, right? So that maybe if she didn't feel like going downstairs to happy hour or whatever the case is, um, maybe she could play Jeopardy, you know, or play a trivia game collaboratively with, with other people in the facility and then get to know her neighbors without having to, you know, get her hair done and put lipstick on. That's the case for me. Sometimes you just don't feel like it, right? And then you had a place to start from, and then you, um, you have some shared connections. Um, what if uh, I was talking to Sunil in the uh, well-being clinic, um, and he was talking about how visibility matters and, and people having their stories told matters. What if you can connect with the stories of other people in your residential aged care communities and get to know your neighbors a little bit and realize, oh my gosh, you were both involved in this cause or this school or um, this activity. Um, so you have, again, a place to start from for a relationship or a way to keep building that relationship, even if you're not physically together. Um, in talking with Jane and Jasmine, some of the work that they had just done in residential aged care here, they found that activities that people did weren't really designed to create the social connection. They are kind of one way and independent, like bingo, for example, where it's just me against buying by myself. What do we think about this in an integrated system? <clears throat> so we have in-person activities that are designed to be collaborative and relationship building, and then digital and virtual activities that can pick up where those left off or give people a foundation to build from. I think all that's possible. Like I said, in a perfect world, I it would be people talking with people. <laughs> you know, but one of the people that we met with last week for this study, he has a nephew who is Pentecostal, and that is just very different set of beliefs than he has, and that's all the family that he has. Most of his friends are gone, and he's ill and struggles sometimes. These devices 
might help, might nudge the needle a little bit, right? With being able to connect or interact, to feel like there is a presence and it's not quite so empty. It's not a magic solution, um, but I think it's a it's a stop along the way of thinking about the value of voice and how we can create opportunities to connect on a number of levels, face-to-face -face and digitally. It's easy as researchers right, to get kind of lost in the data. So I do use measures that, you know, uh, scales that measure feelings of depression and social networks. And I use that in conjunction with interviews and it's easy to get lost in trying to find statistical significance. Um, but I was talking with Sonia Padel at the Living Lab and we were talking about just outcomes. Who decides what outcomes matter? You know, we, we want to see those scales nudged, but if it makes a difference in somebody's life, isn't that what we're after? <clears throat> so that's what, what, what we're trying to keep in mind as we go forward in the study is how do we keep that audience in mind, keep the participants in mind, design from their perspective and um, co-create solutions that can contribute to a, a richer, happier, better quality of life when we're experiencing a longer length of life. People and technology together for a better world. Um, I appreciate being able to be here um, in Melbourne, working with Swimber and working with Jane and Siri. Um, and I hope this is just the beginning of um, collaborations to come. Hit me with your hardest questions Amazing. now. Amazing. Thanks so much, Valerie. That was really a joy to listen to, I have to say. I, I look at these... <laughs> devices with more with more hope now I think I've told you before that there is one in the house that I'm currently living in and it doesn't get my accent and it just totally like misconstrues me all the time <laughs> um, <not> that <laughs> <laughs> anyway we have some we have a couple questions but I, I do encourage others to pop their questions into the q and I think that's right isn't it Paul yep yep <laughs> that's you. right yeah. Right. So I have a great we've got a couple of questions from Mark. Mark Silver. Mark's clearly a big fan here, Valerie. Um, so he says, This is fabulous. Can you talk more about the interaction between these devices, e.g. Alexa, and the internet, e.g. Google Earth, sites for reminiscence, migration places, etc. And and also what do you think about facilitating group interaction across geographical areas? So there's two questions there. Um, yeah. Over to you. Cool. Um, hi, Mark. Mark has been great. He talked to me early on about where, where, and how I might recruit and help help give me some vital info of people to follow up with. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, I think that um, right now, you know, the capabilities are pretty simple, especially when you're just talking about uh, the audio only version. Um, but when you get to those with screens, um, that's where I think. Um, it can become more interesting and connected. Um, <clears throat> so in, uh, in most of our studies, the top activities are listening to music, just like it is with most of us, listening to music, you know, asking for the weather, asking for news, using them for kind of household management and functional things like timers, um, alarms, reminders, um, that type of thing. Um, when they're used for music, though, you talked a little bit about um, reminiscence, I guess. When they're used for music, um, we've had participants talk about how they like the lyrics coming up on the screen because then they can sing along. Um, actually, a woman I was talking with yesterday talked about having uh, sing-alongs for hours because that used to be a really important part of her, her youth was um, when her dad was home from the war, her mom would, would hire a piano. Um, and they would have like family sing-alongs. Um, so just being able to see those lyrics can be really useful in, in that. Um, integrating with Google Earth um, is probably not great right now. The, the interaction, the engagement with the screens, I think is really lacking because you should be able to say, I have an Amazon version at home uh, in the US and you should be able to say, show me a map of... Um, like show me where Perth is or something like that. 
and it should come up. I know where it is now, by the way, um, but it should, <laughs> but it should come up on the screen, and it doesn't really do that. Um, so I think the integration is not is not super great. Um, I don't know that it can it can work with Google Earth, um, but you can absolutely facilitate. Um, you can. So here's an example of how it can facilitate group interaction across geographical areas now. You can play games with people like across the world. Um, so there are, in even the first study that we did, we had a list of games that you could play and some of them were trivia games. Um, and you can do multiplayer games. So you can, you can um, and it'll match you up with whoever else is playing at that time. So you can play like trivia games against someone in Denmark, for example. Like what I'm particularly interested in is, can you do something like that with just people in a residential aged care facility? So can you play, you know, Jeopardy or a music trivia game or something like that with just those, so it's geo-targeted to just your community um, so that you can be strategic in that. Or to your point, if it could be geo-targeted to, um, if you can say, I wanna play against someone um, in Norway because you have like family connections in Norway that you could do that. But long story short, I don't think it does that very well right now. Okay, um, ready for the next one? Oh yeah, intergenerational programs. No, no, we're going to Abbey's question. Oh, um, okay, cool. How is this being rolled out as a commercial offering? Which is kind of what I'd written down as well, which is like, I think uh, also, uh, what's the interest in like aged care providers then? You know, are they taking it up and, and putting it into their aged care offering? I don't know if this is what Abby is saying. Maybe their their question is slightly different. So answer them both. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, in the US, I think it's just super spotty. I mean, I had a student who, I had a student from Illinois where he worked in a, a nursing home that had these in every room. Um, I haven't seen that in Nebraska. The only ones I've seen in, in rooms are those that we've, <laughs> that we've placed there. Um, so it's spotty. Um, Amazon in 2021 launched um, basically kind of an a, a Alexa Together program that was targeted at aged care um, so that you could um, subscribe to that program. Amazon is like constantly pushing their services. You could subscribe to that program and then you could be able to, um, you know, drop in on your relative, which you can do without subscribing. But you'd also get notifications about their interactions which they would consent to of two, of course. So you'd know if they had interacted with the device at all that day and kind of what they'd done. So that was a bit of a kind of safety check. Um, I haven't found any data about the uptick on that or, or how many people are, are using that. They're kind of aware of the market in that way. Um, here, um, I'm, I'm not aware in Australia, um, the dominant device tends to be Google. I'm not aware of any facilities using it um, kind of commercially here or um, health systems using it kind of across the board here. Okay. Um, um, here's another question from anonymous attendee, which is like awesome, really, isn't it? But <laughs> I am wondering if these devices have the capacity to speak in different languages of the world. Has the research had any focus on users with languages other than English as their mother tongue. As you know, the older we get, it's highly possible that our main mother language takes over the ability to communicate. Yeah, great question. It can, uh, it is usable. It depends on the device. Um, Google supports more languages than Amazon because Google has more data, right? Google, people have been doing voice searches with Google in multiple languages for a long time. Um, from what I know and what I've read, um, the functionality is more limited. And so even when I was um, looking at Fulbright opportunities, I chose an English speaking country because the greatest range of functionality is still offered in English. But I think that's a really great question um, and something that I, that I love to look into is just in other, um, in other communities. So I've focused on older adults and super passionate about that audience. Um, but even older adults speaking in other languages or um, even marginalized communities. Like I think about, um, you know, who, who may be feeling particularly alone. Um, yeah. 
Well, let's go back to Mark's qu other question, which is about intergenerational programs. Um, so has there been any use of intergenerational use of this um, kind of capability, I guess, as you yeah. teach technology so easily to older adults? Yeah. Um, here and there would be kind of my answer to that. We've spoken with um, Anna Donaldson and Lively here that's kind of all about um, intergenerational programming. Um, and they have, they work with youth to work with the older adults in a variety of capacities, including tech help. I think they've only had one instance of, uh, of an older adult looking for help with um, a voice assistant. So it's just not super prevalent here. Um, but I, but, you know, I think that would um, certainly be really useful. We see people interacting with them with their with their grandchildren and, and relatives for sure. I mean, a lot of the people who have gotten them have gotten them from their grandchildren, nieces, nephews, whatever. And then it seems like half the time, that's a made up number, but it seems like half the time they then like sit in the closet for a while because like the niece, the well-intentioned niece sends this, um, this Google Nest to her aunt or great aunt, but then like doesn't actually set it up for them and teach them how to use it. And the other half of the time when someone teaches them how to use it, it's a grandchild or great niece or whatever, um, and connects it with their music provider of choice. Um, and then it becomes um, a regular activity when they come to visit too. We often see them kind of interacting with it when they get together and, you know, asking, trying to stump it and asking it different questions and just showing them different kind of capabilities. Cool. All right, here's one from Neil Thomas. And um, we've wondered about the mental health applications for voice assistance, such as to provide some supports for broader self-guided programs that we run. One hesitation we've had is the impact of the I don't understand, the I know how this feels, because that's what I get a lot, mm -hmm. response, which as well as increasing friction may undermine the human-like response. Did you have any mm -hmm. feedback from the people you've interviewed on their reactions to that? The, yeah, I understand, presumably. Yeah. It's interesting. It hasn't um, in the people that we've. And most of the people that we've worked with have ha started getting accustomed to that and then kind of being able to work through it or or accepting that as kind of a, a maybe a, a, a part of the value exchange. Like, okay, sometimes it doesn't understand me and that sucks, um, but I do get this music that I care about or it does do these other things for me. So um, they've found that kind of parameter, that, that barrier, and then they've kind of worked through it or, or accepted it. Um, in the people who, uh, who didn't continue with the devices, which we've only had a handful in the studies that we've done, um, no one has specifically cited that as, an, as a reason. Um, the reasons that we've gotten were um, like it making noise when it wasn't supposed to. <laughs> so them feeling like it speaks for no reason. And that was weird and freaky deaky, which that's understandable. And they're like, nope, I'm done with this. Um, or just just generally saying it's not that valuable to me. You know, it didn't like work into their lives. It wasn't providing any value for them. And they're like, nah, I'm I don't really want it. Um, but that's a good question. I think that there's a there's a lot of um you know, that can get frustrating when you run up against that. We've had some people who talk about how they wish that you could modulate the voice more. So for hearing purposes, right, that it could be higher or lower. At least now there's a wider variety of voices to use. Um, but there are a lot of limitations to it. In a perfect world, it wouldn't be an Amazon or Google product, but it'd be something that were developed specifically for older people where the where the data was kept and used for the for the benefit of the of the older people themselves um and in the meantime i hope that we can learn from from what is possible sort of commercially it's good as well though that you give these examples right of things that you can ask it or do with it 
I mean, does that come if you buy one of these voice assistants? Do you get that kind of material anyway? Because like that, yeah. could, that could be a good starter pack, couldn't it kind of thing? Yeah, all it comes with is something about this big. So it's like the size of a sticky note, kind of like a little packet that generally, well, this is the, it's a little bit different between Amazon and Google, but generally there's kind of a little starter packet like this that mostly just talks about what the buttons are, like how to turn it on or off, um, mute it, um, and then maybe three or four things that you can do with it. Um, but we have, we've had a lot of people who've had them too, who don't know what else they can do. And so I have that list of things um, up on like on my bio on my website because I had so many people asking about it um, just to and it's helpful just to be able to read off the words and see if it's something that's useful to you um, but it, it doesn't do a great job of training we've had people she, the most common response we've gotten about how people learn to do stuff with it is through advertising that they see. So through through average through the ads about the devices on TV or something, um, or through packaging that they get. So particularly with Amazon in the US, when you get an Amazon package, then it may have, you know, they're desperately trying to make this device work and figure out how to make money off of it. So it'll tell you different things that you can do with it you know, just in the packaging from any Amazon product that you offer. So that's how a lot of people what, what kind of um uptake have you have you had from google and amazon and these um huge behemoths <laughs> in terms of their interest in working with you on what is obviously something that has like great human value do you do you have partnerships or any buy-in or relationships with these organizations <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I don't at the moment. And I, I need to work on it. And I haven't because I think, um, I think this could be valuable for them. Um, but again, I also recognize that in a perfect world, it wouldn't be, you know, it would be tech that wasn't owned by them. But in the meantime, I tend to work in a really applied way. So it's like, this is available now. These things are challenges now. So how can we, is it, uh, does the benefit outweigh any risk or cost um, for people connecting with things and people and places and spaces they care about now? Mm. We wish you well with that. Okay, mm. is there anything else? Any final reflections from yourself, Valerie, about Australia and the the differences with the US that you might have picked up around working with these kinds of devices? Yeah. I mean, I do think that they're more common in the US, um, but we're finding folks here. And again, if you know of anybody, let me know. Um, but it's 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 been interesting. It's usually it's, you know gifts from people. We see that across the board. It's music, we see that across the board. Um, uh, more common here to to use Google. Um, that's that's kind of that's that's what we've what I've taken away so far. Um, cool. But I am really excited about. It's been really great to meet with people here um, about the related research they're doing, especially with just thinking more about co-design and co-creation and how to, um, yeah, make sure that we're incorporating starting from the the voice of the community themselves rather than kind of pushing my ideas onto what I think may or may not work. So I appreciate everyone here. And again, I'll come back every time, anytime, every time. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. It's been really, really interesting and kind of different and stimulating. So thanks so much. And thanks very much for being here and putting up with the weird post-pandemic Melbourne vibe. It's good. It's working for me. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Bye, everybody. Great. Thanks. Thanks, all. Um, and uh, look, if you want to reach out to the Social Innovation Research Institute, feel free to send an email to sii at swin.edu.au or just research at swin.edu.au. So thank you all, and uh, we'll see you at the next session. See you later. Thanks. Bye. Mm -hmm.